What does perfect symbiosis between a manga and its anime adaptation look like? This. Manga author Ryoko Kui really popped off with this one, and her panels are such great blueprints for action animation that while many of Dungeon Meshi's most impressive episodes make creative departures from the source material, episode 17 pulls out all the stops in the animation department and treats the manga panels as snapshots, following them closely while still creatively filling in all the space in between. So let's break down the animation and storytelling and compare it a bit to the manga along the way, and hit the ground running because there's a ton to talk about this week. This one was directed by Akira Furukawa and adapts chapters 37 and 38. We pick up right where we left off, and Kaburu uses his way with words to diffuse the situation between Laios and Shuro. And what better way to start the breakdown of an incredible episode than a little bit of nitpicking? Because storyboard artist Yoshiyuki Kaneko takes these panels from the manga and turns them into an over-the-shoulder shot of just Shuro. And I think this was a great opportunity here for this to be a point-of-view shot where both Shuro and Laios turn their heads in unison to look directly at the screen, more similar to the original version. Kind of like this one of Chilchuk and Marcel later in the episode. Not only would that have been funnier, it would have also done a better job of showing that Kabru is using his words to intentionally redirect both of their attention towards himself and away from each other. Chilchuk realizes that he made the wrong choice last episode and Laios gets all mopey. This three frame loop, combined with some camera shake, is our first introduction to the harpies and the animators once again use this harsh underlighting effect to make it look extra creepy. especially combined with the fact that they mostly have no eyebrows. This isn't the first and won't be the last monster that mimics human appearance, and Ryoko Kui and the animators adapting her work do a great job of tweaking little details like this to make them look almost human, but just wrong enough to fall into that uncanny valley. This lighting choice isn't as obviously motivated by a light source as it was back in the glowy lake, but there seems to be a vague indication throughout this scene that the fire Maizuru had lit is the main light source. Marcel seems to be the only one who's as creeped out by Kabru's fake smiles as I am. <laughs> And they've actually added a few more insert shots to this scene that make it a bit more energetic and make the background battle between the ninjas and the harpies a little bit more present. Including this fully anime original cut featuring the Ushioni again, which I believe was absent from this chapter. I also like this little added insert shot of Chilchuk grabbing Marcel's sleeve. It's just eight frames of animation, but it gets across the sudden burst of frantic energy that Chilchuk exemplifies and the smears and simplified angular shapes remind me of Kai Ikarashi's style. He's not credited for this episode episode though, so I wonder if he filled in just for this quick shot, or if this is someone else just working with a very similar style. There's an interesting nuance to the smears here too. The motion is initially led by Chilchuk's fingers, but in this frame, the fingers actually slow down a bit and rotate more towards the camera in anticipation for the grabbing motion while his wrist continues to accelerate, meaning that the fingers are no longer smeared while the wrist is. It's almost imperceptible when you watch it at full speed, but it's there. And those extra few harpies that fell from the sky at regular intervals throughout that scene also serve to desensitize you to them, which makes this sudden inversion of the formula all the more shocking. And now, it becomes clear that Fallen isn't just a bird, she's a bird-slash-dragon hybrid. With features that become more bird-like in the front and more dragon-like at the back, she's still got those big, thick hind legs and massive dragon tail. This is something truly terrible. <laughs> Very cool. Well, Laios did draw that little sketch of his perfect monster, a monstrosity that combined parts from a dozen different animals, and remember how he waxed poetic about how cool basilisks are? The body of a chicken. The tail of a snake with spurs sharp as knives and loaded with venom. So it does make sense that when the person he loves the most in the world gets to become the monstrosity of his dreams, he would be excited more than anything. Whoa. Uh, oh. Oh. Uh, speaking of which, a lot of anime likes to remove some of the more explicit details from the manga art it's adapting. This is one of the only shows that I've seen that joyously adds in even more nipples and balls. This is a whole new side of Kuro the goofy dog man that we haven't seen before in this sequence by Akira Amemiya, who's been a staple animator for Trigger since before it was even called Trigger, as well as numerous other studios having done tons of key animation for the likes of Gurren Lagann, like 
seemingly most of it. Kaiba, shout out to my boy Masaki Iwasa. Kill a Kill, the Tatami Galaxy, shout out to my boy Masaki Iwasa. And most recently, directing basically the entire Gridman series. Though this is seemingly the first time he's worked on this show. And he does some really cool work here with close-up shots to emphasize the most important parts to help your eye follow what is a very chaotic scene with big jumps between a lot of key poses. Kuro flies up towards the camera and there are three frames of close-up on the inside of his mouth before he chomps down on Fallen's wing. We then cut to an extreme close-up of the tip of his sword blade right before he stabs. With each of these strikes, including to a lesser extent this one, he shows you the weapon, then the strike, and your brain fills in the gaps. Senshi's got his priorities straight. And with a series of impact frames that actually serve to transition seamlessly between these two shots, it's confirmed that not only is she a bird, not only is she a dragon, but she's also still very good at doing magic and casting spells and whatnot. I gotta say, I absolutely love that under his armor, Kabru is business casual, baby. Got the skin tight khakis. He's gotta stab the f out of a gigantic, beautiful, monstrous, lovely, terrifying winged beast at 2.30, but he's got a marketing meeting at 3. Here's another incredible sequence, this time from key animator Yoshitaka Mano. It starts off with some cool camera movement to raise the energy and break out of the slower shots that came before, but the star of the show is obviously the effects anime that's introduced with these three impact frames. The lightning itself is cool, of course, but I think what really sells this shot is the way it affects the lighting of the scene. The background fades away into black, not just to isolate the subjects of the shot, which they also do from time to time, but to emphasize the brightness of the foreground. If you were to film this with a camera, to get proper exposure on something as bright as this, you would need to lower the exposure so much that everything else would actually fade into darkness. The same is true to a lesser extent, even with the human eye, so our perception of light isn't based on absolute brightness, but contrast. But even more important than that is the rapidly changing lighting on Laios and Fallen, which animates along with the lightning, and it's not just an overlay. If you pause on any of these frames, you get a different lighting condition with two or three light sources coming from different directions. These actually don't match up perfectly with the lightning itself because they're animated along with the movement of the characters, which are on different layers from the lightning, but it's all happening so fast that that doesn't really matter. Also, have you noticed that Kensuke is looking a little different? different lately? What's that about? This whole battle section has been following the manga panels very closely for the most part. Often when I say that they've mostly taken the manga panels and put them on the screen, it means that there are relatively few creative storyboarding and animation decisions, but that's not the case here. Each of these cuts generally match up pretty exactly to the manga panel, but they've taken those panels and interpreted them as snapshots of larger moving images and filled in the blanks in very creative ways. It just goes to show how well the two versions can interact with each other, and it's a testament to how well Kui already portrays the motion, especially in this chapter, and it's no wonder it took two months to create. For reference, for anyone who didn't read it as it came out, which includes myself at this point in the series, this chapter came out in August 2017. The series just finished in September of last year, and it's under a hundred chapters long. This lady took her time, and it shows. That also plays into the fact that this Kabru shot was, once again, a cliffhanger between chapters, and it was unclear if his attacks would be fatal for another two months. This boy is a master of suspense, and an unfortunate consequence of necessary episode structuring choices is that despite his best attempts, a lot of that suspense gets neutered. But, I mean, would you have preferred anything other than to have this as the end of episode 16? I've been talking about how Laios and Kabru have opposite strengths. One understands monsters, the other understands humans, and that really culminates in this display of how unstoppable Fallen has become in this form. With the strengths of both a human and a monster, and a body that's a hybrid between the two, Kabru's attacks are ineffective. And of course, leave it to this show to have the most important outcome of this battle be that the characters learn something about the anatomy of this creature. Oh, and he's dead. Yeah, that's okay, he's used to it by now. Marcel breaks character a bit when Fallen starts ripping her shirt off in a moment that I'd wager is even better in the English dub. If I'm honest, Marcel is the only character whose English voice I haven't totally been sold on, and that may be because, while people seem to really like her as Nami in the live-action One Piece, Emily Rudd doesn't seem to have much, if any, specifically voice acting experience. Until now. But when she breaks out of that sing-songy cadence, and lets more of what sounds like her real voice through in agitated moments like this, I'm suddenly fully on board. Same with that bit in episode one where she talked to Laios like he was a dog. Laios, no. No! While we're at it, I continue to be pursued by the world's most tenacious Latin American, so let's see what they've got. Not bad. Honestly, I hate to admit it as a fellow American, but as much as those Europeos talk silly with their goofy little words, I think the Spaniards actually have you beat on this one. 
What about Italian? Ooh, that's nice. German's gonna sound fun no matter what. Ah, I'm getting distracted. Anyway, where I was originally going with this was that Shuro's face here is easy to miss, but also terrific. Can people be friends without it being gay? Pop quiz. Why do you think Kui would have put these two characters next to each other in this panel? What could these two, in particular, possibly have in common relating to this scenario? Hmm. Reading comprehension tip. Stop assuming things are accidental. The sound design in this scene is haunting. The way Fallen's voice fades smoothly into a shrill, dissonant, what sounds like a synth tone of some kind and fills the entire space. And there's a cool subtle use of 90s era CGI here to show Marcel's protection magic, which I didn't even notice until going through this a second time. And Senshi still has his priorities in order. These couple cuts by Sushio close out the battle with some really cool cooperation between foreground animation and background art. You can see that there are two versions of this wall, the unscathed one, which is masked along with Fallen's claws to reveal the obliterated version underneath. You can even see the mask moving in places like this where a brick is protruding from the wall but it isn't actually fully revealed until a few frames later. They've added the characters to the background of this shot along with a ton more spikes and this motion kind of reminds me of No Face from Spirited Away. Okay, there's so much incredible animation in this episode and let me know what your favorite moments were in the comments but I have to pick up the pace because we're barely halfway through and I'm biting off more than I can chew with editing this video and the second half is a bit more low-key anyway. But this brawl between Laios and Shuro is animated in a surprising level of quality, and I'm so glad that it is because this is such an important character moment for Laios. I love how, for lack of a better word, animated he is as he explains that taking care of your body isn't some frivolous thing, it's the very thing that shows that they're taking this seriously, and the amount of rotating metal plate mail that went into this while still making it look solid and consistent is insane. And grouping these two chapters together means that we get to see the same memories from both characters' perspectives in one episode, making it even more heartbreaking. I was just as gripped by this scene as the battle that preceded it. We've never really seen legitimate rage from Laios before, and this is so real, human, and relatable. Not only is this an autism moment for Laios that shows that it's not just a goofy, silly little meme, it also shows how neurodivergence can sometimes clash with Japanese culture, which places great importance on social conformity and reading the room, and which is personified by Shuro both here and when Mikbel later exclaims that it's super weird for him to have just suddenly proposed to Fallen out of the blue, in addition to him just being a pretty repressed guy in general. All this time, Shuro had been deceiving Laios in the name of what he thought was tolerance while actually thinking he was a burden. Truly, how was Laios supposed to know that if he didn't tell him? His only crime was being excited to have finally made a friend, and if Shuro had just told him he was being annoying, he could have done something about it. Laios is generally a pretty happy guy, unafraid to follow his idiosyncratic passions, but this conflict really reveals so much about the struggles that he's probably dealt with his entire life interacting with people and why he feels so distant from humanity as a whole, identifying more with monsters. Okay, I'm supposed to be doing a breakdown of the formal elements, but that scene just really gets me. And finally, the episode closes with greater understanding between all three party members, Kabru included, who has not come off well so far, but it's clear that he is at least legitimately trying to do whatever he thinks is in the best interest of everybody around him. He did still casually consider murdering Laios on the spot though, and is still lying to him about being interested in dungeon food, so he's got some significant room to grow. I also love this little detail here that Laios's drawing of Fallen is crude and childlike, showing his actual artistic skill, but his drawing of the three-headed dog is way better, indicating that he's practiced drawing this particular monster a lot before. It probably wasn't even necessary for him to draw it here, just as an incidental example for this explanation, but he chose to anyway. You thought we were going back to the surface? F*** you, we're going even deeper! Hot dog was this one long, sorry about that, but it has to be my new favorite episode. Let me know what you thought in the comments, and Speaking of videos that are too long, I recently re-released my extensive comparison between the 90s and 2010s JoJo's Bizarre Adventure adaptations, which is one of my favorite videos I've ever made. If you enjoyed this one, I think you'll like that one too, so you can check it out right here. And thank you so much to my patrons who are helping support the channel and bring it a little closer to financial viability. Scrubbin, Katie L, Siege Weasel, Retro Hime, Serial Isle, Leia Pico, Nudaf, Patrick Davison, and Lisette MT, as well as everyone else you're seeing on the screen right now. See you next time and uh, subscribe.